Good morning. Uh, how is everybody? Everybody feeling good? Yeah, good. Me too. Um, so for many people, uh, this will be uh, the beginning of uh, perhaps the most interesting of the labs. I don't know. Uh, certainly heart and cardiovascular is popular uh, for a lot of people. Um, and I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'm going to try to shut up uh, so that you can actually uh, do uh, the first half of an activity. That activity is going to be um, uh, measuring your mean arterial pressure and your BMI, and then finding a correlation or whether there is a correlation between those or not. Uh, I'll get to that in a, in a bit. Um, uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to talk about blood a little bit, uh, the identification of blood cells, and then I will uh, switch over to the heart. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the structure of the heart, cardiac flow uh, patterns, and um, and depending on, on the time, how fast I have been or not, uh, we will cover some of the vasculature in the body. Uh, this is certainly an area where I am not going to um, cover even remotely uh, the, the majority of it. We'll just sort of cover the big, the big vessels um, in the chest, and uh, then I'll uh, give way so that you can actually do some stuff in the lab here. All of this, uh, particularly the heart structure stuff, is. Uh, the groundwork that you're going to need for Monday, during which uh, we're going to dissect that pile of pig and cow hearts that are in the hood over there. We'll, we'll set out stations for everybody, and we can do that. Who's ever, is anybody, I'm sure some of you have. Okay, well, you're going to get another chance. You probably haven't done a cow heart. Have you done a cow heart, any of you? Big. They're about as big as your head. They're enormous. Uh, but functionally the same. So, um, all right. Any questions? We'll just do this. Oh, and Snow Pond is coming. I think. I think it's been weird. I haven't been able to actually meet with those students since uh, they were here. So, yeah. Can you believe that? I haven't had class with them. Um, we had a uh, snow day on Wednesday, so that was the day I was supposed to meet with them. So we'll see if they actually bring in their permission slips and show up. I don't know. Um, they're meant to, though. Hey, man. I'm going to keep the lawyers happy. It's cool. It's all right by me. Uh, erythrocytes. Uh, erythro simply means red. And, uh, for example, if you have a uh, erythema, erythema, E-R-Y-T-H-E-M-A, erythema is simply red, puffy, inflamed skin. So erythrocytes are red cells, or specifically red blood cells. Um, erythrocytes are important for a lot of reasons, but histologically, uh, in terms of identifying cells, they're important because they are your reference point. They are what you're going, just like I said, you know, find an, an, an anatomical feature as a reference point and then build relationships off of that. Uh, likewise, here, you're going to, when you're looking at a blood smear, you're going to be, uh, the, the vast majority of the cells you're looking at are red blood cells, and those are your reference point, all right? So a, ref, uh, a red blood cell is uh, probably going to be the smallest uh, whole cell that you see. Uh, it will be, in fact. It's, they are seven micrometers. That U stands for micro. Uh, so seven micrometers. And uh, when you're looking at them, they're really distinctive uh, beyond being uh, the vast majority of the cells there. They don't have a nucleus. Uh, there's not going to be any uh, real identifiable organelles or, or anything like that in a red blood cell. Uh, they stain red uh, with eosin, which is the stain that the blood smears will be prepared with. And uh, when you look at them, there is going to be a lighter... Uh, it, it'll get, uh, it'll go from sort of darker red on the margins to a lighter color in the middle. And this is because red blood cells, to increase their surface area to volume uh, ratio, have, are kind of the shape of, uh, 
I don't know, you know, they're squashed in in the middle a little bit, like some sort of uh, candy, I think, but I can't actually think of whatever, huh? Maybe like a Smartie, sure, yeah, rounded on the edge. Smarties are sharp on the edge, but yeah, sort of like that. Yep, uh, and so because of that, they, they stain lighter in uh, the, the center. Uh, so we're gonna be comparing all the white blood cells that we see to the shape of, or the size in particular, of the red blood cells, all right? If you know that a red blood cell is seven micrometers, and the cell you're comparing it to is twice that diameter, then it's 14, and that's gonna be characteristic of a certain uh, category of white blood cells, for example. All right, so uh, white blood cells are divided up into two groups. Hello. Uh, we have granular leukocytes, um, and a another general term for that is a microphage. So you've heard the word microphage before. Uh, when I was talking about the CNS, and not uh, all microphages are present in the CNS, but some of them are, and they are uh, granular. Right? So we call them granular because they have very distinctive granules that uh, are going to stain uh, in a, a very unique way. Uh, the categories are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, next are the agranular leukocytes. And yeah, these don't actually have granules. Um, uh, they are monocytes and lymphocytes. So we're, I'm going to go through those five categories. Neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, monocyte, and lymphocyte. All of them, uh, particularly in the agranular, monocyte and lymphocyte are... Uh, themselves very large categories that have a lot of subtypes within them. All right. So first, uh, neutrophils. Um, I guess actually before I say neutrophils, boy, oh boy. Um, if yeah, so you may see these slides better on your thing. The projectors kind of work. Um. When you uh, look at one of the red blood cells, for example, you see how it's much lighter here, or here. They, they're rounded and then sort of flattened in the middle. Uh, seven uh, micrometer. So a neutrophil, um, I really want to make that dark. A neutrophil is about 10 to 12 uh, micrometers. So uh, here are the margins of it. Here are the margins of it. Uh, and Compare that, you can see that it is, you know, not, not much more than about 50% uh, larger than a red blood cell. Um, the distinctive uh, characteristic of neutrophils is their nucleus. So they have these uh, many lobed nuclei, which is uh, where we get the other name that they are commonly known for, which is PMNs or polymorphonuclear, poly meaning many morpho-shaped nuclear nucleus, so the many-shaped nucleus, nucleoside, PMS. And if you look at it, there's these several lobes. So this one has five lobes, this one, again, five or six, here's, I don't know, four or something. But, uh, and they should be, by and large, uh, all visibly connected in kind of a chain, so many, many lobes. Sometimes it can be a little bit confusing because they can just be a, like a horseshoe and seem like uh, there's, there's only uh, one or two, but the thing that you would have to go off of then is the size. So it's about a 10 to 12 micrometer. Uh, all right, polymorphonuclear. Uh, there, the projector is not doing a very good job, uh, but and the other thing about them is when you look at the cytoplasm of them, they're going to they're gonna be kind of lavender, this like light purple, uh, this, this light, light uh, lavender color. And then the nuclei are going to stain a, a darker blue or, or, or purple, much darker staining. Uh, you may see on a really nice prep, you may see some speckling 
uh, in there. This projector is not doing nearly a good enough job of picking up what are light uh, speckling even in the image that I have in the PowerPoint. Uh, next are eosinophils. And uh, eosinophils, the cytoplasm is going to stain a little bit darker uh, than the neutrophils. So I said these are the granular leukocytes, right? Uh, and it's these granules that are staining uh, are kind of darker. You can see them in the neutrophils or the PMNs, but uh, they, they don't start staying quite as darkly. The eosinophils, they, they certainly do. So when you see uh, the, the cytoplasm of these, you're going to see this really characteristic dark uh, speckled uh, patterning of the lysosomes uh, in the uh, cytoplasm of the eosinophils. Because of the darker staining, they call it eosin, is a type of stain, fill meaning loving. So eosinophil. They uh, love to, to take up the eosin stain. stain. So now um, the size of them is from 12 to 17 micrometers. So significantly larger. Uh, we have this is 7. Uh, this is almost. Uh, this is almost twice as large as a red blood cell, um, and so that would be on the small side for an eosinophil. Um, so when comparing an eosinophil to a neutrophil, we have uh, the fact that it's important. So the, the nucleus is going to be bilobed or horseshoe shaped. It's going to be two large, un, uh, uh, unbroken up lobes uh, that have a small bridge or the bridge may uh, be so large as one single uh, continuous horseshoe. Um, so the shape of the nucleus, if it were a neutrophil, you'd have uh, more uh, chunks, sort of more, more blocks. Uh, you'd have the speckling shape. And the smallest eosinophil may uh, be the same size as the largest of the neutrophils. So we have sh shape of the nucleus, uh, size comparison, and speckling pattern nucleus uh, to, look, to look for, to compare those two. Then uh, basophils. So basophils, uh, if I put one of these on the test, you'll be lucky because they're actually quite difficult to find. Um, so uh, the vast majority of blood cells are red blood cells. Uh, so white blood cells themselves are not especially common. You're, you know, in within a particular uh, 40x uh, visual field on the scope, you're only going to have a few white blood cells to begin with. And of those, less than half a percent uh, are going to be basophil. So they're pretty rare. They're hard to find. You have to look pretty hard in a smear to find one. Um, but if I do, uh, the thing about them, is they, they are the same size as a neutrophil. They're the same size as a, as a neutrophil. However, uh, they stain very differently. Uh, their nucleus is large. This projection isn't really doing a good job of showing it, but uh, this whole blob right here is the nucleus. So this is stained a little bit uh, differently than this, and this is a bit darker. The rest of the cytoplasm is a little bit darker. Um, Basophils are darkly stained. They stain very darkly. Um, the uh, reason their nuclei are not as compact as the others, their chromatin is re relatively uncondensed, so meaning that the DNA is unpacked. Uh, what else? Yeah, so in, in the cytoplasm, you can see these really deeply, darkly stained uh, lysosomal granules, the vesicles there, that uh, are happy to take up the, uh, the blue stain. Oh, yeah. Is that, was, that been, was that blocky? Okay. All right. So... Next are the monocytes. So moving on to the A granular. Uh, monocytes are, uh, without a doubt, the largest of them. 
the, the very smallest monocyte is going to be twice the diameter of uh, a red blood cell, and it may be as much as three times the diameter of a red blood cell. So monocytes are big. Um, and their nucleus is going to be kind of awkwardly <coughs> shaped. All right. Um, it can have, it, it can be just sort of this oddly lobed amorphous blob. Uh, it can look like a horseshoe, which is sometimes why uh, they can be confused uh, for eosinophils, but they're not eosinophils because they don't uh, have the, uh, the granular speckling that you'll see in a monocyte is not nearly as dark as uh, an eosinophil. Um, I guess that's all I'm going to say there. Next are lymphocytes. Um, so lymphocytes are an extremely large category. Um, and their their uh, blood smear is going to have a significant number of lymphocytes. Uh, so any B or T cell would be considered to be a lymphocyte, right? And and these are part of the adaptive immune system, uh, the immune system that uh, is going to have a specific antigen response, or you know you get infected with something or you have some sort of pathogen. There's going to be a, a specific molecular recognition that helps your immune system adapt to that. This is in, in opposition to what's called the humoral immune system, which is just like, if it's not, if it's not on the team, shoot first and ask questions later. So that's sort of the, the first line of response to sort of, if it's not a native, blast it. And then the adaptive immune system uh, tries to give a more nuanced approach. So uh, they are about the same size as a neutrophil or a, uh, yeah, neutrophil. So um, what else do I want to say about them? When you look at them, uh, the nucleus actually fills the bulk of the cell. So if you're going to compare it, it's the same size, it's the same relative size as uh, a neutrophil. You can clearly tell the difference because a neutrophil is going to have that chain of nuclear lobes, right? The polymorphonuclear uh, leukocyte. And in, in a lymphocyte, you have the bulk of the cell volume filled by the nucleus with just a little bit of a rim of uh, lighter staining cytoplasm. Um, so they are the same size, but the nucleus is very distinct. Uh, you can have uh, activated. Uh, you can have activated uh, lymphocytes that uh, get up towards the, the larger end of the range in size for a neutrophil. Most of them are uh, just a, a little bit larger than a red blood cell. All right. So uh, what do I say? If seven to eight micrometers yeah so this is uh, you know probably about eight right there if you get an activated one it's going to be uh, it's going to swell up a little bit in comparison otherwise uh, the, the appearance of them uh, is is independent of that okay and lastly our uh, platelets. So platelets are when you have what's called a megakaryocyte, uh, in it, which is a cell that's found in the bone marrow, blows up and sheds these, these uh, fragments, these anuclear uh, fragments. The goal of a platelet is simply to uh, assist in blood clotting. So if you have an injury, platelets aggregate with one another and, and help to uh, they kind of act as the bricks, if you're building a dam or something, they can act as the bricks, whereas the like fibrin that helps with the clot 
can be sort of like the order uh, to stop a clot or to stop a blood uh, hemo in hemostasis. So they're really small. They're easy to identify. They're much smaller than a red blood cell. They have little spikes coming off of them. Uh, they're they're uh, no nucleus, like I said. Dark staining. Okay. So uh, what is this thing? Name them. What, what about this one? Okay. You say it, but why do you say that? Bilobed, granules, and its size. Huh? Size. What about this thing? It's a little too size. It's about the same size as a red blood cell, just a little bit bigger. Uh, and then what about that? Neutrophil, why are you saying? Yeah, many lobes, shaped like an S. Uh, and then what's that little thing? A platelet. Okay. Great. What about this? Uh, let's say that one. You guys say it. Okay, a monocyte. Why do you say a monocyte? Okay, because it's pretty big. Any other uh, thoughts on that? Okay, well, we'll come back. Let's say this one. What about that? Lymphocyte. All right. And why do you say lymphocyte? Small. It's about the size of a red blood cell. Exactly. All right. Uh, we've got some platelets there. What about this? What about this baby right there? Monocyte. Okay. And why do you say mon? Monocytes are what are the characters? They're large. They're large. Uh, light blue cytoplasm, kind of a uh, large blobby shaped nucleus. Okay. And then what was that one again? Remind me, I forgot. Huh? A neutrophil. Okay, and why was it a neutrophil? What are the characteristics that you notice in it? Lots of new lobes, size. Okay, great. Uh, all right, we could go on with that, but you get the idea. Um, here are some cross-sections of, uh, of an artery and a vein. So the inside of an artery or vein, any of these vessels, is called the lumen. Uh, and that word refers to like your gut, for example. The inside of your intestines would be uh, the lumen of your intestine. Um, and uh, there are essentially three layers uh, to uh, an artery or a vein. And arteries and veins do not differ in the parts they have, they just differ in the relative size and proportion of those parts. So uh, here, uh, it's, it's called the, the tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica uh, adventitia. You can use, uh, so adventitia is kind of an older term. It can be a tunica interna, a tunica media, or a tunica externa. Uh, you'll also see. Um, and the way these layers work is the tunica uh, 
interna or uh, intima is going to have it's a, like elastic fiber layer through there. And then in the tunica media, this is the muscular layer. So the inner one is the elastic layer, uh, the middle one is the muscular layer, and then there's this connective tissue uh, sheath, which is called adventitia. In general, adventitia is a layer uh, of connective tissue. So the tunica or tunic is a coat of connective tissue. So, um, yeah. Here's some other pictures. Um, so you have this uh, epithelial layer on the inside that uh, is making elastin, that makes it really elastic. You can see here how it's folded in, kind of weaves back and forth so that the artery can uh, expand, it has a sort of like elastic property, it can change its volume. Uh, that's one of the ways that your circulatory system um, evens out the blood pressure, right? So you have your heart slamming the blood, which we'll talk about in the lecture today, and it, there's a big pressure wave in the artery, and to keep it uh, from having like high variability in pressure, uh, to like sort of even the pressure out, uh, there's this sort of uh, capacitive uh, property where uh, it expands, it absorbs some of that energy uh, from the pressure wave of the heart and then slowly releases it and comes back to its normal uh, size. So your, your cardiovascular system transiently uh, changes its volume with each uh, beating of your heart. And that's due to this elastic lamina. Out of your artery. Then the biggest difference between a vein and uh, I'm sorry, a vein and an artery are that this tunica media, this muscular layer, is a lot thicker in arteries. Arteries have a lot more muscle around them than a vein. Veins tend to be much larger uh, to accommodate the uh, lower pressure, and uh, and they are kind of floppy because they don't have nearly as much tunica media as you see in, as in an artery. Um, and then finally, uh, there is uh, this connective tissue, this adventitia on the outside. There's plenty of elastic fibers in there as well that are also going to help it uh, expand. All right. So this would be a neurovascular bundle. You have. This is a really common motif. Is the body lays down these courses for uh, the, the passage of vasculature, a, a vein, and an artery, but uh, the nerves follow those same courses. It just makes sense. They're the highways. So it's a van, a neurovascular bundle, vein, artery, nerve. Uh, is there anything? else here. This is all the same. Okay. On to the uh, heart. So the heart itself sits in the mediastinum. We've talked about the mediastinum. It's one of the sub uh, subcategories of the ventral body cavities, specifically in the thorax. Uh, we have the mediastinum and then the two left and right pleural cavities. Um, and the mediastinum itself is uh, you can think of it as being broken up into three or four regions. Uh, there's an anterior and a posterior mediastinum. It's, it's really, the way you think of it is there's the mediastinum where the heart is and there's everywhere else. Uh, and you can kind of divide those up. There's area anterior to where the heart is, posterior to where the heart is, and superior to where the heart is. The heart more or less sits uh, right on uh, the base of the diaphragm. All right. Well, I was going to say here, I have all this text that sometimes I ignore. Um, yeah, okay, well, right, I can say this. Uh, so some of this other area, and this is important, actually, because um, 
a couple of years ago, I had a woman named, maybe it was just last year, uh, Roisin Morgan, um, who is a, uh, a cardiac imaging specialist at Maine General uh, from uh, Ireland. She was trained in Ireland, a really interesting person, came and, speak, and spoke to the class, gave, put all these amazing videos and images of the heart up there. Um, but um, so your esophagus and your trachea uh, run. Trachea doesn't matter, but they're they're both in this posterior mediastinum. The, the esophagus is important though, uh, as it heads down towards the hiatus and the diaphragm, because you can do something what's called transesophageal echocardiograms. They ba it's basically a, a form of ultrasound where they stick this tube down your uh, throat and they point it at the back side of the heart from, through the esophagus and you can get really uh, amazing videos of the function of the heart. Uh, yeah, that, that technology's come a long ways. It's really quite uh, important. A diagnostic tool now, and that's because of the esophagus and its uh, proximity to the heart in uh, the posterior mediastinum. All right, so let's look at the position of the heart. Um, you know, it is a little bit shifted to the left. People put their hands over their heart uh, over here. Your heart is not way over here. Uh, it, it is more or less centered, but uh, a, a lot of the business end is uh, shifted to the left side of the heart. Knowing the specific uh, orientation of it, with respect to the rib cage and the sternum is, is pretty important be, uh, for a clinician because, I mean, it be, it'll become internalized. You got, like, whoever gets to that point, a nurse or a doctor, uh, have to learn this really well. But uh, you, you can feel which rib you're at, and then knowing which rib uh, juncture you're at, you put the stethoscope there, and you're listening to a specific uh, region in the heart, right? So if you know how the heart maps on to the rib cage below it. Tell you, uh, it, it can help you in terms of uh, localizing a, a problem that may be happening in the heart. Um, I don't show, I should, uh, in the muscle chapters when I normally talk about it, there's this area, I, I didn't this year, there's this area in your back, um, I don't know, for those of you who are flexible, Put your uh, hand back there and feel along the inferior medial edge of the, uh, of the scapula just to the midline below that. There's a little, what's called the triangle of auscultation, the, tri the triangle of listening. You can see it uh, right here. Uh, you, can see, you can feel it right here. There's a little triangle where your ribs, you can really feel your ribs real clearly along the bar bottom uh, margin of of your latissimus dorsi, that's a really good place to get a clear sound of the heart uh, unmuffled by the uh, unmuffled by the muscles of your back, and it's particularly useful on the left side, uh, which would be focusing right here on the left ventricle, which is one of the uh, probably hardest working parts of the heart. All right, so heart itself, uh, the way we, it's kind of an upside down pyramid. It's a pyramid that's been stood on its head. The apex, which means the, the peak of a mountain uh, or the point of something, the apex of the heart is actually pointing inferiorly. Uh, so it, this is the apex. And then across, uh, oh, I'm sorry, across here, where all the great vessels emerge from the heart, we call that the base of the heart. So the base is on the superior side, and the apex is on the inferior side, sort of intuitively. The heart itself is wrapped up in this uh, serous membrane that we've talked about before, the pericardium. There's a visceral pericardium that lays right on the heart, and a parietal pericardium that branches off of it and wraps around to come into contact with the visceral pericardium. There's a little bit of uh, serous uh, exudate that is in that space that enables the heart to beat and do its contraction business in that space without any friction or problem, ideally. All right, so here's the, myo, uh, 
the myocardium, the uh, wall of the heart, the muscle wall of the heart, myocardial muscle, cardiac muscle wall. And uh, here we have the parietal pericardium on the surface of the heart. There's the visceral pericardium. Uh, if you are, are talking about the pericardial cavity or the serous membrane, uh, you would use the word parietal or visceral pericardium. But if you're talking about the heart, uh, specifically the organ, uh, the word epicardium is, is sometimes more often used. But epicardium is totally synonymous and identical to the visceral pericardium. They are the same thing. And they are both of those words really are, you would choose one or the other based upon the context of what you're discussing, all right? So visceral pericardium is something that is uh, referring uh, it as in opposition to the parietal pericardium, whereas epicardium is, just a, as a, is the superficial structure of the heart, if that makes sense. Um, so what does it look like? There's a layer of squamous epithelium, then some connective tissue, and then we get into this uh, muscle wall of the cardiac muscle, the myocardium. Uh, and then there's some more connective tissue, loose connective tissue. Uh, I think areolar, I think it's areolar connective tissue, so real nice and stretchy connective tissue uh, there with another layer of endocardium uh, or endothelium. Squamous, sim simple squamous epithelial cell layer. Side of the heart. So that's the microscopic anatomy of the heart wall. Um, there are some heart models in the lab here. Um, the nicest of them is mine. So please be please be uh, nice to it. It's this one here. Uh, try to bring my big heart. Uh, to every lab, but particularly these labs, uh, be kind to it. Where did it go? It was here. A second. Uh, which one? Yeah, that big boy right there. Uh, and then there are uh, three others. There's that antique that should be retired and put into. I think that is a plasticized actual heart. I think it's an actual heart that has been somehow plastic, like injected with hard wax or something. I don't know, but it's clearly a lot older than, uh, than any of us. Uh, and then there's these two uh, plastic models that Hobie owns. I, I'm going to buy some new ones eventually. I'm trying to get things. Uh, so I think this one is, is actually a pig heart. One of them's not human, but they're the same. A pig heart and a human heart are virtually identical. Um, all right. So those are the heart models in the lab. Uh, let's, let me go over the anatomy with this. If you want to grab uh, a heart model, you can go over it on the model itself uh, while I go through this. So the first thing, I remember when I uh, went, uh, when I was in cadaver lab in, uh, at, at, uh, at the school at Notre Dame, I, when I got into lab, I felt profoundly unprepared. Uh, they went over the anatomy uh, of the heart in lecture, but then uh, they didn't go over it in a way that you would approach the heart in the, in the actual lab. Um, so I got this thing, it just looked like a lump of gray-brown mess with like flaps and tubes sticking all over it. I really couldn't make heads or tails of it. Uh, and I have since uh, come up with my own sort of way of looking at the heart. Uh, I, that happened then that helped me make sense of it. Um, when you have a heart in your hand, uh, it's a pig heart, right? The heart you're going to have is a pig heart. Uh, and so I try to see a pig. Uh, there, the first thing that I noticed is I, I get the orientation right. That's pretty easy. The base sticking up with the tubes, all, all the remains. Uh, but you're going to have... These two little flaps, these two flaps on the heart. When we dig into them, you'll see what I mean. These flaps are called the atria. Uh, uh, pardon me. They're, they're called the oracles. The oracles of the right and left atria. Uh, what does the word oracle mean? Yeah, yeah, your ear, the oracle. 
Um, and so I think that's why they named them, because maybe the anatomists would look at look at it and saw uh, pig's ears or something. They do. They look like little like pig's ears or dog's ears that are sticking over uh, the, the directionality of these two oracles. If they're pointing towards you, you're looking at the front of the heart. If they're pointing away from you, you're looking at the posterior. So get the heart and get the orientation right, right. If you can get the orientation correct, then you'll know which is the left and which is the right. Uh, you'll know which is the, the top, which is where the oracles are. And then, of course, the ventricles are going to be below that. So get orientation right. The, the oracles are flaps that are laying over the, the top, emerging from the base of the heart uh, and pointing uh, towards you. Um, the one on the right is part of the right atrium. It's the oracle of the right atrium. And the one on the left is the oracle of the left atrium. Below that, closer to the apex, are the right and left ventricles. The uh, right ventricle is significantly smaller than the left ventricle. The right atrium is smaller than the left atrium. This is because the right side of the heart is responsible for pumping blood, receiving deoxygenated blood from the body and pumping it to the lungs. So it's dealing with low pressure blood and it's not sending the blood very far. We'll see, we'll see some plumbing uh, for that in a moment. Amanda, I know you're yeah. trying to visualize it. This will be, this next slide here will be an ideal opportunity for your artistic talents. Uh, but uh, it's dealing with low pressure blood that's going to the lungs. Whereas the left uh, side of the heart has to generate much higher pressures because it's sending blood everywhere else. It's got to send it to your toes, your nose, and everywhere in between. Um, right, so uh, you've got the orientation of the heart right, the two uh, oracles pointing towards you. The very first thing that uh, the, the, the most anterior of all of the vessels that you're going to see is this pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary trunk. Uh, we'll see a better uh, depiction of this in a moment, but you can take my word for it that the right uh, ventricle is what's leading into the left, uh, I'm sorry, into the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk then bifurcates, if you're lucky and your heart, uh, the pig heart hasn't been hacked apart, uh, you'll have all of the structures that you see here. This pulmonary trunk goes up, and it looks like it slams right into the aorta. Uh, at that point, it bifurcates and sends one uh, branch, this left pulmonary artery, to the left lung, and then the other one dives under the aorta and sends uh, a, a right branch to the right lung, a right pulmonary artery. So then uh, this other big, muscly, thick-walled tube that you're going to see, uh, hopefully in, in its entirety, is arching over the top of this bifurcation. That's the aorta. Now, in the actual pig hearts, a lot of this is probably going to be packed in fat, which will then be covered by uh, epicardium. All right, so to really see it well, you may have to pull epicardium off. You may have to uh, excavate some of the fat that surrounds all of this. That's probably not going to be nearly this clean and clear. Um, there is uh, then to the uh, right of that is this uh, superior vena cava. Now the superior vena cava is a vein that has very low pressure blood, uh, first of all, so it's not going to be thick wall like these. These are both really like kind of sturdy uh, vessels that really maintain their shape. So this is probably going to be collapsed and may be entirely hacked off so that there's nothing but a hole there uh, that you'll have to dig around for that goes into the right atrium. Uh, the superior vena cava, uh, you can't see it in this thing, but there's an inferior vena cava. If there's superior, there's going to be an inferior, which is basically coming down right here. I guess it would be going up into the right atrium, going up uh, and meeting the superior vena cava. Superior vena cava draining the upper extremity, inferior draining the lower extremity. What else? So interestingly, uh, there is this thing called the ligamentum arteriosum. 
uh, ligamentum arteriosum, every once in a while, uh, the, the patient dissector in class is able to reveal that. The ligamentum arteriosum is a bit of connective tissue that pins the aorta onto the pulmonary uh, bifurcation. All right? And um, this serves a couple purposes. In the adult, it, it kind of uh, it, uh, acts as a pressure anchor uh, for the uh, aorta as the or aorta uh, goes through its pressure wave. As it, it's another anchor point that keeps it rooted to the base of the heart uh, and gives it some resistance that it can uh, act against. But uh, the most important uh, function of the ligamentum arteriosum is when you were a baby, uh, or not even a baby, and a fetus in utero, uh, this is not a ligament, it's actually a tube. We call it the ductus arteriosus. There is a shunt between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. There are two different short circuits between the right and the left side of the uh, heart which are a consequence of fetal blood supply, which I think I might have a slide that will show you about in a bit. It's really fascinating uh, how the blood circulates. In it. And what happens is uh, at birth, the uh, baby comes out, and uh, as soon as the baby takes its first breath, the lungs inflate, pulmonary blood pressure goes up, and uh, there is an immediate uh, sympathetic uh, autonomic response, the fight or flight response. We'll talk about that today. But uh, the muscle, smooth muscle in that ductus arteriosus clamps down uh, and closes off this so that uh, the first breath a baby takes, uh, it switches over from fetal blood circulation to adult uh, or uh, ex utero uh, blood cir circulation. Uh, there's some interesting pathology associated with that. Um, does anybody know? I know this is the generation of uh, Prince Harry and William, probably no one in here cares at all about the, the royals at all. But um, when I was your age, it was Princess Diana, of course. Uh, does anybody know? Uh, the story of how she died. You, know, you guys remember Princess Diana? She, she was married to Charles. Was Charles, next in line. To... Well, she uh, was. Her and Charles split up, and even before they'd split up, the paparazzi were on her like flies. Uh, the camera, camera guys, and she had been dating someone. I don't know. Whenever she got into a uh, limo. And the paparazzi were on their little motorbikes zooming after her, and she told the limo driver to uh, step on it. So ripping down the road, uh, got into a tunnel, accident, really bad car crash, rapid deceleration, uh, anteriorly uh, displaced the heart in the chest cavity. And the ligamentum arteriosum actually just... Uh, ripped a hole in her aorta, and she bled out internally very rapidly. That couldn't have been a fun way to go. Uh, it's interesting. There's also people with, I, I knew a guy, I was an artist in a previous life, and um, uh, I had gotten a commission from this guy who uh, had, like, was a, a big wig at, some flower company in New York and had hired me to make a piece of art for his partner who had uh, just died from this connective tissue disorder uh, where the uh, ligament had, uh, had detached and spontaneously in, in his sleep in, in bed uh, had detached and had the same problem as uh, Diana. So there are connective tissue disorders that can be latent that can lead to similar pathology there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, man. You have to be right on the spot. You have to be right on the spot. And it's in the aorta. I don't, that is a pretty good death sentence, it seems like. Uh, anything else? Okay. Uh, no, we'll get to those arteries, uh, the cardiac vessels in a minute. 
ordinary vessels. Um, I think that's all here. Oh, whoa. Yeah. So coming off the aortic arch uh, are these three branches. There is the brachiocephalic trunk, brachio arm, cephalic head trunk. Right, so the brachiocephalic trunk. It's going to have two branches. This is on the right hand side. The first branch is the brachiocephalic trunk. It's going to have two branches. Those are going to be the right common carotid and the right subclavian. Uh, on the left side, you don't have a brachiocephalic trunk. Those two uh, branches come straight off the aorta. All right. Uh, so you have a left common carotid and a left subclavian. Uh, common carotid is going to go up into the head. Subclavian is going to go sub below clavian clavicle. Uh, it's going to go below, below your clavicle. Uh, brachiocephalic trunk. This head is another little bit on there. You see that it would branch to the uh, right, uh, the right uh, common carotid. So those are uh, important branches for the head and neck and arm. Um, so this is kind of what you would normally see uh, heart and C2. This uh, person's done a really nice job of dissecting it. They have cut the uh, epicardium, peeled it back, exit, so you can see the leaves of uh, the pericardium there. They've excavated uh, some of the coronary vessels. Uh, we'll go through those in a bit, but we have essentially the right and the left uh, diving back this way, the right and the left coronary arteries. They're coming off the base of the aorta. The left coronary artery emerges from behind the uh, emerges from behind that pulmonary trunk, uh, and the the uh, left coronary artery has this branch that goes down in what's called the interventricular sulcus. Uh, sulcus is what I said. Divot burrow, right? Yeah, burrow. Um, and um, yeah, so let's look at the back of the heart. We have um, a right and left ventricle. Uh, so the left here is uh, on the left side because we're looking at the posterior aspect of uh, the heart. And uh, the right. Uh, here is the right atrium, here's the left atrium. So now we can see this right pulmonary uh, art artery that we had missed earlier. It's painted blue here because uh, it is emerging from the left ventricle. So let me give you some terminology. If I, you know, you ask most people what is an artery and what is a vein, they'll say, oh, an artery is carries oxygenated blood and a vein carries deoxygenated blood. That is not actually the case. Uh, an artery is simply a vessel that's leaving the heart that has higher pressure blood and a vein is simply a vessel that's coming to the heart that has lower pressure blood. On the left side of the body that misconception is correct in fact. Uh, arteries are oxygenated and veins are deoxy. But on the right side of the heart, uh, it's the opposite. All right. So the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary trunk with its right and left pulmonary arteries are called arteries. But in this picture, we paint the blue to denote the fact that they're deox. It's carrying deoxy, high pressured deoxy blood to the lungs to get oxygenated. All right. So, uh, and then that blood is returning to the left atrium through these pulmonary veins, painted red because they are uh, oxygenated blood, but called veins because they are returning to the heart. They're returning to the heart from the lungs. All right, so the blood comes out, this tube goes to the lung, comes back via these tubes. So the left atrium re receives four, uh, four vessels, uh, the right and left uh, pulmonary veins. So there's going to be a, a right superior, a right inferior, a left superior, and a left inferior uh, pulmonary vein. You'll be lucky if you see them. Uh, usually when people hack these out, I don't know, like we get these from butcher shops, right? 
uh, when they when they hack them out, that those guys used to just like whack off uh, the the back of the left atrium. Oftentimes, the whole back of the you know, left atrium is missing. Uh, so you may, some of you certainly will be able to find those vessels, but many of you won't. Uh, and they're veins, so they're very thin walled and flat. So it can be a little bit hard uh, to just say, oh, there they are. They don't look as nice as that. Uh, you can see the aortic arch. What's out? Oh, yeah. Uh, the inferior vena cava. Now, uh, looking at the backside, you can see uh, the inferior vena cava right there, uh, bringing blood into the right atrium from the lower extremity of the abdomen, the legs. Um, so... The right and left coronary arteries. Coronary uh, refers to the corona of the heart. So there are these coronary arteries that uh, go around the corona or crown, or actually the base of the heart, uh, through here. I said there's the right and the left. I'll have a better picture. But since we're back here, I'm going to show you the one vein that drains the heart. So these coronary vessels are supplying blood to the myocardium of the heart, to the actual uh, cardiac muscle that's in the heart. And this vessel, which is called the, uh, the coronary sinus, oh yeah, here it is, coronary sinus, uh, and then the great cardiac vein, that's not labeled, uh, the great cardiac vein is the vein that drains the, the heart and then goes into this coronary sinus. The coronary sinus uh, returns blood right to the uh, right atrium. So there's three doors into the right atrium. There's the superior vena cava, which is bringing blood from the upper extremity, the inferior vena cava from the lower extremity, and then the special door uh, is from the coronary sinus. And you can find this if you are careful. The nice thing about doing actual dissections is if you know what anatomy is supposed to be there, you go looking for it, you'll find it. You'll find it. In a plastic model, that's not the case. But in, in the actual hearts, you'll find the anatomy if you're careful. Because it's got to be there. Uh, all right. I think that's all there. So let's get on to the plumbing. Um, Let's, let's start uh, in the toe. Uh, blood in the toe, down here, this is, this is the toe. Uh, blood is going to come up through the inferior vena cava, come into the right atrium. Uh, it could come from the nose and come down the superior vena cava into the right atrium. Low pressure, deoxy blood. Uh, right atrium contracts shoves it into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid three-tooth valve. There's three leads on uh, the tricuspid valve. Uh, so the valves that separate the atrium and the ventricles are called the atrioventricular valves in general. There's two of them. There's the tricuspid and the bicuspid or mitral valve. They are atrio ventricular valves. Um, so blood from the right atrium goes through the uh, tricuspid atrial ventricular valve into the right ventricle. The right ventricle then is going to contract and blast blood through this pulmonary valve. The, the valves that leave the ventricles are called the semilunar, half moon uh, valves, the semilunar valve. Um, and they're much stiffer than these are like flappy little leaves. These are like kind of collagenous, thick, uh, snappy things. So it uh, gets ejected to the pulmonary valve, goes out the right and left pulmonary arteries to the, uh, to the lungs, gets oxygenated, and then they're going to return to the pulmonary veins, uh, the right and left superior and inferior pulmonary veins, to now the left atrium. Uh, the left atrium contracts, pushes the blood through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. The left ventricle, which is really the workhorse of the heart, blasts it out through the aorta, uh, through the aortic semilunar valve. 
uh, goes through the aortic arch, goes through all the arborizations. Uh, here, some going to the upper extremity, some going to the lower extremity, and then we completed the cycle. All right? That's cardiac circulation. So here's the same thing in a different uh, chart, the exact same thing. And uh, what I like about this is that I simply added uh, this one little thing here, that uh, blood that's coming off the aorta out of the left ventricle can go into the coronary arteries, the arteries that are serving the heart itself, and then return via the coronary sinus uh, to the right atrium. So there's this additional little loop that I put in. Uh, let's look at this. So let's, we're coming out of the aorta, we go down the descending aorta, and there are, uh, there are really two ways that you can get back through the lower extremity. You can either go through the kidneys, gonads, lower limbs, all of that is all pretty analogous. Uh, or you can be blood that's going to somewhere in the GI tract where you would be absorbing nutrients. If that is the case, if you are uh, a blood that has delivered oxygen to the gut and potentially picked up uh, some more cargo that was ingested, we send you to the liver first. We send that blood to the liver through what's called the hepatic portal system. It's this portal system, it's this like a shunt that uh, takes anything that was ab absorbed in the GI tract and runs it through our filtration system first. Right? The, the liver is where we detoxify, the liver is where we store glucose as glycogen. Uh, so liver gets first dibs on any of the good stuff that you would come across uh, in, in the GI tract. Does that make sense? But then all of it coalesces into the inferior vena cava and comes back to the heart. Um, so here's a cartoon of the inside of the heart, and we'll go through this anatomy. You know, I'm thinking that what we're going to do is we'll do this uh, thing. I didn't, this is what I did last year, and I should have fixed the, the chart to do it this year as well. Uh, the blood pressure stuff, uh, we're going to do that. We'll do that on Monday. We'll do that on Monday. And then, uh, because we have a bit of time before the dissection. It's better done on Monday, I think. That's what I did last year. Um, all right. So uh, we just lopped off in front of the heart here. And uh, there's a lot of anatomy here. Let's walk through it. Uh, first, we'll identify everything that we uh, can identify. The heart was facing us. It had the two oracles, the two ears facing us. So we're looking at the front of the heart. We've uh, opened, we've lopped those off and fenestrated the right and left atrium. Um, and uh, let's start with the right atrium. So what you see here uh, is we have the inferior, the inferior and superior vena cava. Uh, we see two other uh, spots. We have the opening of the coronary sinus, and if you take one uh, a probe, a blunt probe, and dig around in there, you should be able to, or even your, your pinky finger, you should be able to find it and stick your finger up in it uh, and, uh, and trace the course of the coronary sinus. Uh, there's this other thing that's not actually an opening, uh, but it is a, a depression. The fossa ovalis. Now, fossa is not a foramen. Uh, fossa is a cavity, like a, a depression, a fossa. Uh, and ovalis oval, the oval fossa, the fossa ovalis. There is one in the uh, right atrium. There's also, and it's easier to find in the right atrium, uh, there's one in the left atrium as well. The one in the left atrium is um, right on top of the one in the uh, right atrium. And it turns out that uh, in utero, I talked about the, uh, the ligaments of arteriosum being the ductus arteriosus in utero. 
Well, in utero, this fossa ovalis is actually called the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale, another foramen ovale, not as it's called. The foramen ovale uh, is, has anyone heard of this before? Yeah. Um, the foramen ovale is another short circuit between the right and the left in utero. Uh, and it's, it's open to the passage of blood. Um, as the baby takes its first breath, it seals over. Uh, and the, the increased uh, pulmonary pressure closes the flap. And then within a week or so, uh, the, the fibrocytes totally seal that off. So all that's left is a really thin part of the wall between the right and left atrium. So if you find it on one side, you can find it on the other, put your fingers together and feel how thin that septum is between the right and left uh, sides of the heart. There is a condition called uh, PFO, patent foramen ovale. Uh, had anyone heard of that before, PFO? Great. So uh, a patent foramen ovale is uh, one of the most uh, common, I think it is the most common cause of a pulmonary embolism. Uh, it is an inadequately sealed, a not completely patent uh, foramen ovale. It's still open. Completely patent or partially sealed. Uh, it's a particular, it's, it, it, can, it happens in like some degree of PFO exists in 10% of the population, so there's a chance that out of the 16 of you in the room, that one and a half of you have a PFO. <clears throat> um, but uh, it's, it's particularly uh, higher in uh, children with uh, trisomy 3 Down syndrome, a higher incidence of uh, cardiac defects, particularly in um, So... The, the, here you can see the three cusps of the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve, the three leaves of the tricuspid valve, uh, are attached by these chordae tendinae. And I apologize for the small text, but that is spelled uh, C H O R D A E, chordae or chords, tendinae, T E N D I N E A E, E A E, tendinae. The chordae tendinae <clears throat> are the uh, tendinous cords that attach uh, the leaves of uh, the atrioventricular valves to what are called the, the papillary muscles. So a papilla is a little hill, a little bump. So papillary, P-A-P-I-L-L-A-R-Y, papillary muscle, uh, is a little muscly hill that emerges from the uh, myocardium. Uh, and the contraction of uh, the papillary muscles uh, pulls on the corded tendine. You think that maybe that's the job there is to pull open the door of the tricuspid valve, but in fact, that's not the case. Uh, what the papillary muscles are doing is when the myocardium is contracting in the right ventricle, papillary muscles also contract and they prevent the relapse of uh, these the relapse of the cusp. They prevent it from getting blown out. Uh, so they kind of pull the uh, leaves together and prevent the door from getting uh, regurgitation. It's called <clears throat> ventricular regurgitation. Uh, then the blood comes up through here, passes through the pulmonary. Um, and we see this, uh, oh, I forgot that, yeah, back here. So you can't really see it well in this picture, but um, in, in the ventricle, at least, you see this kind of Freddy Krueger uh, tissue here. Does Freddy Krueger mean anything to anybody? You watch, what was that called? Nightmare on Elm Street. It's just this, uh, yeah, kind of these uh, layers of uh, weird, oddly disposed muscle fibers. This is called um, the trabeculae carnage. So, where is it? Oh, trabeculae carnate, T-R-A-B-E-C-U-L-A-E, trabeculae, 
uh, carne, C-A-R-N-E-A-E, -E, uh, trabeculate carne. So just like a trabeculate in a bone, where it's like tortuous, tribulated uh, path of the bone, the trabeculate carne are the same thing, but they're made of meat. Uh, the, the meat trabecules. Uh, in the uh, in the atria, we have a similar thing, not shown well in this picture, but we call those the pectinate muscles. P e c t i n, pectin, like the metal pectin eight a t e. Uh, so some person named Peck ate some tin pectinate muscles. Um, what else? There's a lot of anatomy. I think I, I named it. So here's the interventricular septum. There is an interatrial septum. It is this interatrial septum that has uh, the fossa ovalis into atria. Um, I think that is all of the anatomy on that slide. Okay, yeah, coronary circulation. Um, so the coronary vessels are going around the corona of the heart. Um, to be able to view them, this, this I, you know, we know that the pulmonary trunk is the most anterior vessel of the heart. Uh, so to be able to view them, this person just lopped the whole thing right off. They just cut the pulmonary trunk right off uh, at the very base of the heart and, in, and removed it, removed the fascia, and in so doing, revealed the right and left uh, coronary artery. Back the first year I taught this, was what, like 2013? There was a student way before I knew this, right? Yeah. Uh, his name was Alex Sisto, one of your alumni I know. Uh, Alex Sisto, he spent the entire time, entire time just revealing coronary arteries. He never got into his heart. He never did anything. He spent like three hours digging around uh, for his coronary artery. His coronary artery. He did a great job. It was amazing. I kept that heart for years. I may still have it. Uh, but <clears throat> there's the left and the right coronary artery. These are the first branches off the aorta. Heart gets first dips. Uh, because the blood pressure is so high here, and it's kind of turbulent after just emerging from uh, the heart. <clears throat> the coronary vessels, uh, turbulent blood flow has the potential to uh, stimulate platelets and uh, cause inflammation, which can lead to arterial deposits. So this is one of the reasons that the coronary arteries are particularly susceptible in a person with other uh, factors that uh, put you at risk. The coronary vessels are particularly susceptible, susceptible to uh, atherosclerosis or the hardening of the artery. Uh, yes. So uh, the branch. So here's the left coronary artery. It gives off two branches: this circumflex artery that goes around the backside, and then this uh, uh, LAD is what it's often called left anterior descending. I have it labeled as anterior interventricular artery. Those are synonyms, the LAD and anterior interventricular artery. I think LAD is cardiology. This is how the uh, correct. And then there is the right coronary artery, uh, which has some branches that I'm not actually going to uh, hold you responsible. I have already talked about the coronary sinus. Uh, you can see a little bit of the circumflex artery. You can see the great cardiac vein uh, piling into the coronary sinus right there. Uh, you can see the right coronary artery reaching around the base of the heart on this side. All right. This is just a plasticized heart. Uh, okay, let's do this. This will, this will help us in the lecture today. So, uh, 
there is this conduction system in the heart. Now, the heart, uh, myocardiocytes, you don't, they're involuntary, right? You don't think about contracting your heart. You can modulate your heart rate, but you don't stop your heart or start your heart. Uh, God, what a drag. Um, so, uh, there's this innate sort of uh, pacemaker, pacemaker cells uh, in the heart, and uh, it's they're part of the cardiac conduction system. So the, the top of this cardiac conduction system is the sinoatrial node. I don't know about the other models, but that big one that uh, Annabelle has there it has it uh, painted green up there. You'll see it towards, uh, yeah, that would be the AV node. The SA node is up up here, yep, that's it, that's the SA node, sinoatrial, stands for sinoatrial. Uh, sinoatrial node has uh, these internodal pathways emerging from it, which converge on the AV node, the atrioventricular node. So we have atrioventricular node and atrioventricular valves. The atrioventricular valves control the flow of blood in the atria to the ventricle, AV node, located at, a, at that moment. Emerging from the AV node is this AV bundle, which then arborizes into bundle branches that then uh, terminates in these Purkinje fibers. Um, oh, shoot, I forgot about this one. So this is a really fun thing to find in the heart. Uh, let's see, I'll go back to it in a minute. Um, so we've got these Purkinje fibers. This is what a Purkinje fiber looks like. A Purkinje fiber is a myocardiocyte that has specialized itself to be able to uh, uh, elicit a, uh, an action potential from the cardiac muscle cell, all right? Uh, coming off of the right bundle branch is this, uh, this piece of myocardium called the moderator band, and it is a band. It's a, it's a a little uh, cord of muscle fiber about the thickness and size of a shoelace uh, that goes across the uh, inferior uh, margin of the uh, right ventricle. And it's really easy to cut. A lot of students will have hacked it up uh, when they're trying to figure out how to open up the ventricle. But if you're careful, you'll be able to retain uh, the moderator band, which is pretty cool. So there's a there's a uh, there's a uh, some Purkinje fibers that go along that moderator. Let's see if I can get a better picture of it. I, I must have had one that I just totally skipped. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Uh, the moderator band comes across here, and the job of the moderator band is to specifically help coordinate uh, the action of these papillary muscles. So it kind of comes across. And helps uh, moderate the papillary muscles. Uh, that may be, okay, yeah, right. So there's this model uh, right here by Alan. And um, yeah, there are a lot of arteries and veins I used to, uh, I used to drag people through it all. I'm not going to here, but I'm going to do just the really important ones that I'm going to reference in other lectures. So there's uh, basically just the major branches of is what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about branches off of it's just the initial branches off of the aorta, uh, arteries that I care about. And there are no veins that I'm going to ask you about except the inferior So we have uh, the ascending aorta. It's very short, goes into the aortic arch. Uh, and then there's the long descending aorta, which uh, terminates at uh, this bifurcation in the pelvic uh, compartment uh, into the common iliacs. Uh, there's going to be an internal and an external iliac off of that. Um, 
And then going back up here, we have the right and left coronary arteries, which I've already spoken about, the brachiocephalic trunk with its right uh, subclavian and right common parotid. Then there's the uh, left common parotid, the left uh, subclavian, all of which I've talked about already. You go down here and you pass through the aortic hiatus in the diaphragm, and we have just these branches uh, right here, these branches uh, right here in the abdomen. Let's go through those. I'm going to enlarge them. Uh, you can see them, they're, they're labeled a little bit there, but that, I have a better picture right here. So, uh, I don't even know, Alan maybe could, could see, I don't even know if that model has a phrenic artery. I certainly wouldn't ask you about it. But the phrenic artery uh, is something that supplies the diaphragm with blood. The first really major branch in the abdomen is what's called the celiac trunk. This is calling it the celiac axis. Uh, but it's the celiac trunk, and it's a common, it's the first one up the chain. Uh, and the celiac axis has three branches. Uh, there's going to be the gastric artery, which it shows going this way, but actually it goes that way to the stomach. Uh, there's the hepatic artery, which is bringing oxygenated blood to the liver. Oxygenated blood to the liver. And then there is the splenic artery. So, uh, the hepatic artery on this side, splenic artery on that side, and the gastric artery in the middle are the three branches of uh, a celiac trunk. Celiac uh, referring to uh, the stomach. Uh, or the celom, what it's referring to, or the celom cavity. It's the first branch of the celom cavity. Um, and then the next branch is the superior mesenteric artery, and it's servicing the mesentery. The mesentery is this, uh, is this, some people talk about it as its own organ, but it's basically like the fatty tissue that uh, is part of the, um, the peritoneum, so the visceral peritoneum that covers all of the uh, stomach, stomach contents, or the abdominal contents. It, uh, there's this connective tissue that connects it all, and the mesenteric artery uh, has a zillion branches that uh, go into this mesentery. Uh, so the, the, the next big branch is the superior mesenteric artery. There will be an inferior mesenteric artery, which is the last branch off the chain uh, before you get to the termination of it. And then in between are uh, just the hepatic arteries. The, 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 the not hepatic, what did I say? I meant renal. Uh, the right and left renal arteries that are going to the kidneys. Um, that, that's, that's the, those are the branches. So pretty easy. Big one, celiac trunk, then superior and inferior mesenteric artery uh, with the renal arteries. Okay? Artists. I think that's all that I'm going to talk about uh, now. That one is in the lab anyway.